Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless a shocking new study from the nonprofit families against fentanyl shows child fentanyl deaths are rising faster than any other age group deaths among children age 14 and under are 15 times higher than they were in 2015 rising from 10 to 153 deaths in just the last two years Fentanyl deaths quadrupled among infants and children ages 5 to 14. In the time that this broadcast is on, uh, one person more will die. That's about every eight minutes. Uh, we're seeing the numbers grow by basically 50 percent every year. We're seeing that there's very little recovery once you're addicted. If you thought Portland was bad, take a look at San Francisco. There's 20,000 homeless people in Nancy Pelosi's hometown and the you know, looks like opium dens just pop up everywhere. Any moment you see someone shooting up or ODing on the sidewalk. Hey, buddy, wake up. Wake up. Oh, he's awake. Hey, police department, you okay? Yeah. Oh, she's passing it. Oh, Cindy, look at her. She's going to pass it over. Oh, let me take a hit of that crack pipe. You're fent fentanyl addicts. You My husband got me started on heroin. 2012. I'll say it again. Here's the fire department for one, guys. This is just tragic. Somebody must do something. This is absolutely out of control. This is a day-to-day -day thing. What I saw today on the streets of Philadelphia, what I saw is not only heartbreaking, it's terrifying. This was block after block after block. You could see people shooting up, shooting up uh, methamphetamine, heroin, uh, fentanyl. Uh, and the drug that you are talking about is xylazine. It is a tranquilizer that is used on animals. It is not meant to be used in humans. Trank is short for tranquilizer. In this case, xylazine. It's strong enough for big animals like horses. When it's mixed with fentanyl, it gives users a brand new kind of high. So like they start dancing and they, they seem kind of happy and they're just having fun to an immediate like zombie like trance, like staring through you as if like a horror film. What it does to the human body is so terrible, it looks like a film effect. But in cities on the East Coast, where Trank first spread, it's all too real. <laughs> Dr. Jen joins us now with the topic. I'm actually a little surprised we're talking about, even though it's such a huge trend right now, we're talking about microdosing mushrooms. Moms across Moms. the country are using them to treat anxiety and depression. We're talking about the use of psychedelics. Um, recreationally, but also therapeutically. A lot of new moms are reaching for things like mushrooms or psilocybin in micro doses, mm -hmm. but again, what that micro dose is, is, is a big question mark, um, as a way to kind of manage mood disorders. So um, I, I think it's a very interesting phenomenon. There's a lot of interesting science behind it, but it is sweeping the country in terms of its recreational use, and it's a very, very unregulated right now. From gummies to chocolates, many cannabis edibles look a lot like regular snacks, but these THC-infused products are catching more than adults' attention. A report out today from medical journal Pediatrics reveals the rate of children under six eating cannabis edibles is skyrocketing, rising more than 1,300% in recent years. Nearly all of the exposures reported happened in the child's own home, and more than a fifth resulted in hospitalization. Good morning from the beautiful city of Portland, Oregon. These are images and video from an army of citizen journalists in Portland who have been documenting a city in decline. Public drug abuse, addicts sprawled on the sidewalks or wandering the streets, tent encampments on many street corners, and fires seen burning along the roadways. What used to be one of America's most beautiful and livable cities 
is being slowly destroyed by epidemic levels of crime, drug abuse, homelessness, and mental illness. One local is called Portland an open-air insane asylum. Portland has become a mecca for addicts and drug dealers who have migrated here from across the country to take advantage of weak drug laws. It's also attracted drug cartels. There were 11 drug overdoses on March 31st alone, and one pill of fentanyl can cost as little as $1. Things got worse for the city when Oregon voters approved Measure 110. It decriminalized possession of small amounts of drugs, making it a health care issue and not a crime. Police officials say it's led to a huge increase in the amount of drugs on the streets, which has led to a surge in crime. It wasn't always like this. Portland, Oregon, one of the nation's most beautiful cities. The citizens of Portland attend many fine churches. It is a family town. A good place to bring up children. In Portland today, a viral video shows a man using drugs in front of a child. Just last week, a man beat someone with a golf club in front of this Portland restaurant. The nervous owners then offered the attacker hot coffee, which he dumped on the victim. 79% of businesses surveyed in Portland have been victims of vandalism or break-ins. 19% have been vandalized at least five times. Walmart and Cracker Barrel are part of a wave of businesses that have fled the city. More than 2,600 downtown businesses have left. It's not funny anymore. We like to go back to where Portland was just weird. Now it's scary. One writer asked, how long does it take for a city to die? The Apostle John used a very interesting word in the book of Revelation to describe society in the last days as we read in Revelation 21.8 and 9.21. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And they did not repent of their murders, or their sorceries, or their sexual immorality, or their thefts. Sorceries is the Greek word pharmakia, which means the use of drugs, potions, and enchantments, poisoning, pharmacy, by extension the occult, witchcraft, by implication, the remedy, the cure. The actual word that John used for sorceries is the Greek word pharmakia. John did not choose to use the Greek word for an actual sorcerer, but rather he used the word to describe what those types of people did in the first century. Sorcerers made magic potions and compounds to ward off spirits and also for physical healing. The Greek word pharmakia is where we get the modern day word pharma or drug. We also get the words pharmacy and pharmaceutical from that original Greek root word. What the Apostle John saw in his vision of the world in the last days was a society ruled by drugs. When the Apostle John saw his vision of what society would look like in the last days, one word came to his mind, pharmakia. Never in mankind's history has there been a time where the use of drugs was so prevalent in a culture. And never has there been a time when such drug use actually had broad support for its legal use. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. We're taking a look at troubling new data from the CDC. It reveals sexually transmitted infections are on the rise and also show no signs of slowing down. NBC News medical fellow Dr. Akshay Sile joins us now on this. Hey, Dr. Sile, good to see you. So just how many cases are we seeing and do we have any idea what is the reason for this uptick? We're seeing about 2.5 million cases of, of chlamydia, of gonorrhea and syphilis combined. Um, that is up from last year and it's continuing to rise. It's up about 7% over the last five years. And Savannah, the one we're really worried about here is, is syphilis. Um, syphilis is it's, a, it's an STI that can actually cause, you know, if you, if you get this during pregnancy, it could cause your baby to be born, stillborn, or, or dead. Um, and it's an entirely preventable disease with something called penicillin, a common antibiotic. So in talking to the CDC, you know, that's the one that's really most disturbing to them right now, that rise in syphilis. But when looking at why, why are cases rising, there's a couple things that experts are pointing to. You know, the first is decreasing condom use among, among uh, people who are sexually active. 
Uh, the other thing is the rise in, in substance abuse right now, kind of linked towards that behavior. And the last, you know, lack of access to health care and lack of access to education about, about how to have safe sex, how to prevent these STIs from occurring in the first place, Savannah. So what does the say, CDC say needs to be done to slow down this trend, to address some of those issues that we just had up on the screen? A couple things. You know, I think the first and, and one of the most important is really reducing the stigma around these diseases, being able to go to your doctor's office and just talking to them about this stuff. I think that can go a long way. But, you know, in talking to some experts who track this stuff for a living, the thing they really point to is getting STI treatment and testing really, really accessible, meaning you, you should be able to order STI tests just, as, just like you do a COVID test. Uh, maybe on Amazon.com mm -hmm. you get a test straight to your house, really, really getting tests in the hands of people. Um, and the last thing really is just, you know, in terms of looking at future prevention, there is some exciting new data that taking doxycycline, a really cheap, common uh, antibiotic, can actually present, prevent STIs, um, just taking them prophylactically. Mm. All right. And that's something that maybe we'll see more information or more research on? Exactly. That's one thing that is one of the most exciting and controversial fields uh, mm. in, in the world of STIs right now. Hebrews 13.4. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. The other big story tonight is an extremely rare severe weather event in Florida. Experts are calling it a one in 1,000 year downpour as more than two feet of rain swamped parts of Fort Lauderdale within hours, triggering flash floods that trapped people in their homes and cars and left a major airport underwater. Tonight, a massive cleanup after unprecedented flooding. Rescuers had to use boats to access Fort Lauderdale's hardest hit neighborhoods, bringing people and pets to safety after a night surrounded by floodwaters. I'm going to go back and get your mommy and daddy, all right, bud? We had a huge amount of volunteers coming in with their swan buggies and high water vehicles, which has been a huge help. Some people waded through the water with boxes wrapped in plastic trying to keep their belongings dry. Others described having to climb out of windows. I couldn't open the door because the water was too much pressure on the door. More rain fell in a 24-hour period than any other day in the city's history, nearly 26 inches. That's more than 40% of Fort Lauderdale's annual rainfall in just one day. No city could have planned for this. The result was flooded streets littered with abandoned cars. The water's weight is believed to have contributed to a roof collapse at this shopping center. No one was injured. And the main runway at Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport remains mostly submerged today, forcing operations to shut down. The flash floods, a result of torrential rain hammering Fort Lauderdale and its surrounding areas with seven months worth of rain in just seven hours. The reason for this drastic weather change, climate experts are saying that the growing intensity of such storms amid bouts of drought is symptomatic of human driven climate change. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather, and yet it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen, as we read in Matthew 24, 3-8. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming, and the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. The term birth pains is an illustration based on how a woman goes through labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. So we can expect pestilence in the form of extreme weather to continue to be more frequent and more intense right up to the time of Jesus' second coming. As these things get worse, and they will, we know that the Lord's return is not far away. Satan knows he has but a short time and he is using climate change to deceive the masses into thinking it is real, when in actuality it is God letting us know through powerful weather events that Jesus is returning very soon. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, 
lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. John 15, 18-20 If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So you write that uh, this issue points to a larger spiritual battle and a growing climate of hostility towards Christianity. Uh, what is behind the growing hostility? I think this is really rooted in uh, a rising secularism in the United States and a less of an understanding of religion, less of a reverence for religion uh, that we might have experienced in uh, our broader culture several decades ago. Um, but especially after the wake of the Dobbs decision, which overturned Roe v. Wade, uh, we saw increasing just animosity, hostility, anger directed at churches. And just the first quarter of this year, that's at an all-time high. How does this compare, do you know, to other houses of worship, be they mosques, temples, or synagogues? And is, it, is enough being done to protect churches against attacks? Certainly other houses of worship experience attacks as well, uh, but we're noticing a, a significant rise in acts of hostility against churches. Um, and we think that's partly because um, so many of co the core Christian teachings directly contradict many of these secular dogmas that have become so important and enshrined in our very secular culture. Things like abortion, like same-sex marriage, uh, like transgenderism that are on the rise. These issues are in a direct conflict with the core tenets of Christianity. So I think we're going to see this increase. Um, because this issue is so widespread, I think all of us have a role to play. That means American citizens should be condemning acts of violence against churches wherever they occur, and we should be demanding that our politicians do the same. Ultimately, we want to contribute to building a culture that respects religious freedom again. You know, there's been a lot of criticism of the Department of Justice. In your view, do you think the DOJ is biased against churches? I think we see increasing evidence of that uh, in just the fact that these would-be criminals that are angry at churches, that are going after and targeting churches, are not being deterred from doing these acts. To me, that signals that not enough is being done to punish the perpetrators of these crimes. Brothers and sisters, persecution is coming. Believers in Jesus Christ believe in the authority of the Bible. We believe homosexuality is a sin and marriage is between one man and one woman. We believe in the sanctity of life and that abortion is murder and is a sin. We believe God created us male and female and it is a sin to identify as a transgender. We believe Jesus is the only way to heaven and that believing in any other way will send a person to hell. Get yourself spiritually prepared because true Christians will be persecuted like no other time in history. This persecution will be based off of what the world perceives to be moral and right, and not what the Bible says. The sad thing is that many people who profess to be Christ followers will go the way of the world. These professing Christians are called lukewarm in the book of Revelation and are not saved. The world will persecute true Christians, and scripture tells us the lukewarm Christians will persecute them as well, as we read in Matthew 24, 9 and 10. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Many who professed faith in Jesus as the Messiah in easier times will deny him and cooperate in exposing those who are true believers. The external hatred from the world puts all true believers in Christ under pressure. This in turn produces internal hatred among the professing Christian community during the tribulation. When the pressure comes, those who are not genuine believers will do three things. Fall away, deliver up one another, and hate one another. Matthew 24, 9 and 10 lay out a future time of great persecution for true believers in Jesus. Many in the church will avoid this persecution by betraying fellow disciples in Christ to the persecutors. Persecution is coming. A Catholic advocacy group is preparing to sue the FBI for failing to provide information in response to allegations that the agency infiltrated churches to spy on Christians. Brian Birch is the president of Catholic Vote, a great organization that is spearheading the lawsuit, and he joins us now. You've filed a Freedom of Information Act. They've ignored it. What's the next step? 
Well, thank you for having me, Rachel. You're right. We filed this Freedom of Information Act request over a month ago, and the FBI has just a couple more days to respond. We have not received anything from them to date, and if we do not get what we are entitled to by law, we will file a federal lawsuit in the coming week. In order to get to the bottom of what exactly the FBI is doing, spying on Catholic churches, uh, using uh, tripwire and source material uh, from Catholics going to mass in order to inform on them under the guise that Catholics have somehow become a threat to democracy. This thing is so crazy, and the drip, drip, drip tells me um, that we, there is more to this, and the fact that they don't want to answer your Freedom of Information Act um, that you filed also tells me there's more to this story. I'm sure you've thought about this, Brian. Why are they going after Catholics? What are they so afraid of? What is this threat to democracy that Catholics and Catholics who love the Latin Mass are to this administration? Let's be clear, it's no longer just Latin Mass Catholics. The yeah. memo that uh, Congressman Good Jordan point. received uh, pointed out that they're now pursuing mainline Catholic churches. And the question is, and many Catholics are asking across the United States, is it still okay to be Catholic and believe what Catholics believe and still be an American? Why are they afraid of Catholics? Is there a pro-life position? What is it? You know, I think it's a combination of things. I think Catholics stand in the way of this woke ideology that's dominating this administration, whether it be on the pro-life issue, since the Dobbs decision in particular, whether it be on the gender revolution, the exploitation of our children, or just the role of religion in general. I think there's some fear on the part of this administration that Catholics themselves uh, pose um, a problem for the, the agenda yeah. that they're trying to impose yeah. on this country. They consider us enemies of their regime, of the state, but really of their regime and their policies. You are right. We need to hear from all church yes. leaders right now because it's not just this FBI memo. It's a combination of things. It's the failure of the administration to defend our churches that are being vandalized. Over 300 Catholic churches have been desecrated, firebombed, uh, attacked by vandals. And yeah. of course, the way this administration is treating Catholic pro-life activists like Absolutely. Father Mark Howe. Absolutely. Well, all Christians should stand together on this um, because first they came for the Catholics, then they're coming for all of you. Are Catholics saved? The question, are Catholics saved, cannot be answered with a simple yes or no. Just like the question, are Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists, or Lutherans saved, cannot be answered in a universal sense. A person is not saved by being any specific denomination. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone as we read in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. There is likely no denomination of the Christian faith in which every member truly has personally trusted in Christ as Savior. There are an estimated 1.2 billion Roman Catholics in the world, and among those, there is a significant amount of differences in beliefs and practices. Roman Catholics in the United States do not have identical beliefs and practices as Roman Catholics in Italy. Catholics in Latin America are not the mirror image of Catholics in Africa. While the religious authorities of the Roman Catholic Church put forth the notion that all Catholics hold to the same beliefs and observe the same practices, this is definitely not the case. The different teachings within Catholicism is another reason why the question, are Catholics saved, cannot be answered definitively. If we change the question to, are Catholics who adhere to official Roman Catholic beliefs and practices saved, we can have a definite answer. And the answer to this question is no, because the official teaching of Roman Catholicism is that salvation is not by faith alone, through grace alone, and Christ alone. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that one must have good works and observe the rituals of Roman Catholicism in order to be saved. It is important to remember that not all Catholics hold to the Roman Catholic understanding of salvation. There are Catholics who truly and fully believe that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone. So, are Catholics saved? Do Catholics go to heaven? It depends. If the question is, are there saved Catholics? Then the answer is yes. If the question is, will a person go to heaven if he or she holds to the official Roman Catholic doctrine of salvation? The answer is no. Now to the latest provocation from North Korea. The country's leadership says it tested a new kind of intercontinental ballistic missile, one using solid fuel instead of liquid, which could make it quicker to launch. Overnight, the U.S. and South Korea apparently, in a counter move, conducted joint air drills over the Korean peninsula, including F-16 fighters and a B-52 bomber. Impressive pictures there. Ramio Innocencio, 
looks at what it all means. I want to know as well, Rami. Solid fuel missiles have really been a key goal of North Korea for a very long time. And North Korean state media did broadcast the launch of that new missile set to propaganda music from an undisclosed location. Now, these kinds of missiles can be deployed uh, faster, easier, and also more safely. A solid fuel also doesn't degrade as fast. That means they can be fueled long before launch. So that means spy satellites might have a tougher time detecting them. Images also appear to show Kim Jong-un watching the launch and even smiling. Other images show him with his daughter, Kim ju a featured prominently. And it's important to note that anything Pyongyang does here for the public is choreographed. One North Korea analyst says Kim may be trying to portray an aura of stability to the people by showing off his family, and that he may be aiming to produce solid fuel missiles that can eventually fly 6,000 miles. And Dana, that is just shy of New York and Washington, D.C. China issues a new warning as the U.S. and the Philippines hold their largest ever joint military drill. Wow. So Beijing saying the effort to strengthen ties should, quote, not target a third party and should be conducive to regional peace and stability. Uh, this is concern grows over China's burgeoning relationship with Moscow. New poll shows 62 percent of you believe that the partnership between those two countries is a serious problem for us. We cannot oppose China by ourselves. We have said many times that the United States and our allies currently are outgunned and outmanned by China's military. And that's just a fact. And the Indo-Pacific commander has told us several weeks ago, he made a statement, we're in a very dangerous situation, and we have to move with a sense of urgency to fix it. Uh, you say the crazy idea to abandon Ukraine for China. Uh, it's critical to our current world order to assist Ukraine to create a world where we want future generations to thrive in. We don't want Russia, China, and Iran writing the rules. That is what is at stake. Make your case. I mean, when you, got, when you look at Ukraine and Russia, uh, what you have to see there is Russians' ambitions to rec recreate the Russian Empire. It's not just about Ukraine. It's about the former Soviet republics, many of whom are a part of NATO. And when you look at China, China has a partner in Russia. Why? Because China wants to achieve global hegemon and at the expense of the United States, replace us as the global leader in the world. And if Russia, if Russia wins, China wins. Why is that? Because the United States and Western democracies will have lost in their support for Ukraine. And that gives China leverage in Europe, but also in the Indo-Pacific region. Japan, South Korea, who you mentioned, and Australia are all supporting Ukraine. Why are they doing that? That's not in their region. They're doing it because of China. So when we think of the war in Ukraine and Russia and we, it's a distraction because it's taken us away from China. It's actually the opposite of that. If Russia wins, China wins. And they will have incentive to use aggression themselves as a result of the U.S. and Western democracy laws against Taiwan and in the region writ large. For the past 14 months, you have ter heard two main things about the war in Ukraine. The first is that the war in Ukraine is a war of national sovereignty. It is not a proxy battle between superpowers. Russia invaded Ukraine. That was immoral. The United States supports Ukraine because the United States supports democracy. But the United States itself is not at war with Russia. This is Ukraine's war to fight. The second thing we have heard over and over again is that Ukraine is winning that war. Ukrainian troops are brave and noble. Russian troops are evil and incompetent. The Ukrainians are beating the Russians. In the end, their victory is inevitable. Now, you're very familiar with these points because you have heard them every day since last February. You've heard them repeated by every power center in the United States, the Pentagon, the White House, the leaders of both parties in Congress, CEOs and celebrities. And most insistently of all, you've heard them from virtually every single outlet along the entire spectrum of our national news media. These are the two essential themes of the war in Ukraine, and both of them are lies. We know that there are lies because late last week, leaked intelligence about the war in Ukraine began to appear on social media. Briefing slides prepared by the U.S. government began to show up, among other places, on Twitter. And the slides show that this is, in fact, not Ukraine's war. It's our war. The United States is a direct combatant in a war against Russia. As we speak, American soldiers are fighting Russian soldiers. 
So this is not a regional conflict in Eastern Europe. This is a hot war between the two primary nuclear superpowers on Earth. And yet this war has never been formally declared. It has not been authorized by Congress. And for that reason, this war is a violation of American law. It is a crime. The second thing we learn from these slides is that despite direct U.S. involvement, Ukraine is in fact losing the war. Seven Ukrainians are being killed for every Russian. Ukrainian air defenses have been utterly degraded. Ukraine is losing. The Biden administration is perfectly aware of this. They're panicked about it, but they have lied about this fact to the public. Just two weeks ago, for example, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin told the U.S. Senate that Russian military power is, quote, waning. In other words, Russia is losing the war. That was a lie. He knew it was when he said it, but he repeated it in congressional testimony. That is a crime. But Lloyd Austin has not been arrested for committing that crime. Instead, the only man who has been taken into custody, or likely ever will be, is a 21-year-old Massachusetts Air National Guardsman who leaked the slides that showed that Lloyd Austin was lying. He revealed the crimes, therefore he's the criminal. That's how Washington works. Telling the truth is the only real sin. Now our news media exist and have constitutional protection precisely in order to push back against this grotesque standard. Their only job is to tell the truth. And yet tonight, the news media are celebrating the capture of the kid who told Americans what's actually happening in Ukraine. They are treating him like Osama bin Laden, maybe a little worse, actually, because unlike Al-Qaeda, apparently this kid is a racist. Here's CNN. The Washington Post, as you know, reviewed video of this suspect yelling racial and anti-Semitic slurs. Is this a dangerous person? This uh, uh, air guardsman who's now been taken into custody had talked about being a gun enthusiast, had been at gun ranges. He's obviously a member of the military. And he's the big guy in the scene. Somehow he has access to this kind of information and that makes him even larger. A person who thinks they know better than everyone else, they're smarter than everyone else in their view. And that this is a 21-year-old man, he's described as a gun enthusiast, um, feels like in some of these descriptions somebody who's maybe hungry for power. So this 21-year-old Air National Guardsman from Massachusetts is not a whistleblower, CNN explains with the help of the many intelligence agency figures it is now hired as analysts. No, he's not a whistleblower. He's a criminal. Because he is, unlike the people who run our government, quote, hungry for power. Because this 21-year-old was so hungry for power, federal law enforcement had to swing into action with unfamiliar speed and efficiency and apprehend him. He was that threatening. Now, keep in mind, as of tonight, we still don't know where Jeffrey Epstein got hundreds of millions of dollars. We have no idea. Nor do we know what he did for a living. We don't know who left pipe bombs on Capitol Hill on January 6th. Two of them. We don't know who leaked the Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade. We can't even say for certain who killed the president of the United States. Because after 60 years, the Biden administration is still hiding thousands of pages of classified documents from the Kennedy assassination just as they are hiding more than a billion other classified documents. But tonight, we can say for dead certain who embarrassed Toria Newland and Joe Biden. And that kid is going to jail for a long, long time. That's the standard. The media are fine with that standard. Watch this remarkable exchange on Monday of this week between the White House press corps and Biden flack John Kirby. Without confirming the validity of the documents, this is information that has no business in the public domain. It has no business, if you don't mind me saying, uh, on the pages of, uh, of uh, front pages of, of newspapers or uh, on television. It is not intended for public uh, consumption, uh, and it should not be out there. So the fact that U.S. soldiers are fighting Russian soldiers in a war in Ukraine has no business in the public domain. The fact that the country we are backing and fighting alongside is losing, not winning, has no business in the public domain. You have no right to know what your government is doing in your name with your tax dollars and with the future of your children and grandchildren. You have no right to know. Shut up and stop asking relevant questions. Okay, said the media. And if you wanna get really sick to your stomach, go pull a transcript from the Pentagon briefing today where news reporters asked 
flax from the Pentagon, what are we going to do to keep information like this secret in the future? Now, one question about the substance of the information. We're fighting a war against Russia directly? Really? Don't they have the largest nuclear arsenal in the world? Not one question. How can we help you keep it secret? Those were the questions. And not only are the media, not only are the media covering up the substance of the story, which is not who leaked it, but what he leaked, they're covering up the crimes committed to get you this information. The administration apparently used illegal surveillance techniques to identify this kid, apparently with the help of the Washington Post and the New York Times, who are its accomplices. They're not holding government accountable. They're helping government keep you from knowing what government is doing. Today, the Washington Post reported it had exclusively obtained some of the classified documents this leaker possessed. Quote, the Post also reviewed approximately 300 photos of classified documents, most of which have not been made public. Some of the text documents the leaker is said to have written out. So we've got two problems here. If it's illegal to see these documents, if you don't have a security clearance, how is the Washington Post doing this legally? They don't have a security clearance. Well, obviously they were given them by the U.S. intel agencies and are working alongside them. But the bigger problem is this is information that's relevant to the public in a so-called democracy. You can't lie about things that jeopardize our collective future and get away with it. And you certainly shouldn't be doing that with the assistance of the news media. The news media whose job it is to inform you of what your government is doing. But instead they are working actively late into the night to lie to you on behalf of their masters in permanent Washington. And by the way, just last week, the plan was to lie in an even more grotesque way and blame Russia for this. And we're quoting, Russia or pro-Russian elements are likely behind the leak of several classified U.S. military documents posted on social media that offer a partial month-old snapshot of the war in Ukraine, three U.S. officials told Reuters on Friday. Really? Who are these officials who lied to Reuters? And then Reuters just, of course, obediently reprinted their lies, as they always do. News agencies print what they are told to print by the intel agencies, no matter how ridiculous it is, no matter how much dignity and self-respect they exchange in return for doing it. So what's happening to this leaker now is what happens to anyone who contradicts the national security state and their obedient servants in the media. You go to prison so the media can continue to tell you lies. Here's MSNBC, for example, assuring its viewers that everything's just fine. What the Russians didn't understand was that they were going into the lion's den. That kind of, of what, we, what we would say in the military, um, this force multiply, made the Ukrainian army quite literally unbeatable. They are winning. Russia is going to lose this war. Every last person has said exactly what Malcolm just said. They're going to win this war. It's not a matter of if, uh, but when. 14 months in, they are simultaneously telling you that Ukraine's victory is inevitable, mostly because of the moral power they possess. But at the same time, you need to send tens or hundreds of billions of dollars more in advanced weapon systems to Ukraine to keep them from losing. What will they say now that we know the truth and that we know that they lied to us, not just the U.S. government, but the U.S. news media? Deception has been a problem for man since the serpent first deceived Eve in the garden, as we read in Genesis 3.13. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Jesus, when responding to the disciples' question about a second coming and the end of the age, warned them repeatedly about deception. He indicated that deception would be a serious problem in the last days, and that many people would fall, as we read in Matthew 24, verses 5, 11, 24, and 25. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many and many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Deception is ever present, but the days are coming, and have come, when most people will be deceived. Deception will continue to increase until the day of the Lord and the return of Jesus Christ. When Christ returns, however, the one responsible for the deception will then be prevented from deceiving the nations again until the thousand years have ended as we read in Revelation 23. He cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. After the thousand years are finished, Satan will join the false prophet and the Antichrist, 
as we read in Revelation 20.10. The devil, who deceived them, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. After this, the Lord Jesus will establish his unending kingdom of perfection, as we read in Luke 1.32 and 33. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Jesus said this in John 8.31 and 32, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear, that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.